Council meeting. Um, we have uh, a full house, so um, thank you all for, for coming today. Um, and obviously, just be mindful of, of the social distancing. Um, today's business, we will consider a briefing from the um, Freight Transport Association and the Road Hauliers Association on the COVID-19 response and recovery. And I say we have no apologies. Um, Chairperson's business, just advise you that um, along with most of you actually in the committee, we joined CBI Northern Ireland um, Infrastructure Working Group um, on a WebEx, and that was Friday the 15th of May, and we discussed a number of issues that currently affect the various sectoral groups. Um, and the note, a note of that meeting is tabled at page 35. Um, I asked the department to provide an update on a couple of the points which were raised during that meeting, um, specifically in relation to a review of, of planning um, with a view obviously to providing for a faster route through planning for, for major projects which, um, which are seen as critical in Northern Ireland. I understand some of that was discussed in yesterday's budget um, debate. Um, also, procurement and finance, particularly in relation to budget spend on progressing of key infrastructure projects and in respect of issuing new work orders for um, resurfacing work and summer sur surface dressing. Um, and that's obviously, again, just to um, reinvigorate the pipeline of projects post-COVID-19. So there's a note there at page 35 in relation to that. Um, and that meeting was obviously held um, in, in camera. But um, I mean, obviously, we're aware of the number of issues uh, uh, just as we, as we move through that. So um, we'll be mindful of that. We may wish to follow up with um, a number of, of uh, members of that group, either collectively as a group again, or certainly I know Seamus is a member of that group too. So this is another opportunity for to, to speak with him. So members are content. Great. Okay. Chair, can I just come and say that I find that, although I came late to the meeting because I was on interview panel earlier that day, but. Could I just say that I find it very helpful and I would hope that it's part of an ongoing engagement. Uh, you know, I do think it does get to the, the nitty gritty you know, of, of the industry's needs and I, I for one find it very informative and helpful. Yeah, no, I, I did too. I think the only problem obviously was the transmission that day was quite difficult maybe just to, to hear um, clearly and some of our members had difficulty um, tuning into the, the meeting and then participating but um, certainly I thought it was useful and, and while the invitation had come to me I thought it was important to widen it out to, uh, to members yeah. because we, we all need to hear um, what what's impacting on, on various stakeholders um, in and around this issue. So uh, and thank you for those who did take part. Uh, moving then to draft minutes and they're tabled at page three and those are for our meeting of the 29th of April. Um, just advise you that in creating the electronic pack, the formatting of the draft minutes has been lost. Therefore, a properly formatted version has been added to the table papers. But our members agreed. Right. Thank you. Moving then to matters arising at page 22, and those are from that, that same meeting of the 29th. Um, do members have any issues in relation to matters arising? From page 22 on. No, nope, all content. Okay, so during during the committee planning day on the 18th of March, we received a briefing from Assembly Communications and Request Statistical Data on the audience figures for the live streaming of committee papers or committee meetings. The Assembly Communication has responded to advise that this information isn't possible to disaggregate at the moment as only the audience for the day is available and not by committee meeting. So comms has advised that this would be available at some point in the future. However, that may create a bit of competition between committees. <laughs> so I'm maybe not sure that we really want to have that. I encourage bad that behavior. It may, it, may just, it may just, or it may actually put a bit, little bit of, uh, might, people might realize maybe it's the committees aren't maybe just as popular as they would like. <laughs> so, uh, so I turn this, we're gonna take their initiative from some of the priests who have been adding a few one-liners at the end to some of the services. <laughs> Okay, so for content, then we move on then to our briefing from the Road Hauliers Association and um, Freight Transport Association. A range of papers which are relevant to the briefing are in your um, packs from page 30 onwards. Now, obviously, due to um, our social distancing within the chamber, um, I understand that High Communications reassessed the room, and unfortunately, we only had room for for two um, witnesses this morning. So um, we have Seamus, Danny, 
um, Policy and Membership Relations Manager from Freight Transport Association. And we have John Martin, who is the Policy Manager Northern Ireland for the Road Haulage Association. So, unfortunately, um, Pamela and Glenn then were unable to attend as well. Um, but obviously, thank you for thank them for their willingness to to attend. Um, Apologies, I suppose, really, in the first instance to, to John, because obviously we were to have this briefing um, just as the, the lockdown um, started to come into force. So, um, And I understand that a number of the issues really at that particular time have been resolved as we've moved through um, this process, although there are still quite a number which still have to be resolved. Um, so if, um, if John, perhaps if you want to, um, to start us off, if you want to say a few words, uh, and then we'll move on then to Seamus, and then open up to members. <clears throat> okay, good morning, Madam Chairperson, Deputy Chairperson, and members of the committee. On behalf of ourselves, the FTA, and the, and the industry in general, uh, I want to express our sincere gratitude to the committee for inviting us along here today to give evidence during this particularly difficult time. The sector really appreciates all the support that you have provided. Uh, during this uh, continuing pandemic and obviously more support will be needed as we uh, work our way through and come out the other side. We would also like to thank the Minister and her officials within the Department for the role that they have played uh, in supporting the sector and the, with the various relaxations, exemptions and derogations that has helped us cope up until now, particularly in relation to drivers' hours, uh, um, etc. Well, so not, it may not always be apparent, we do, um, we do appreciate it uh, and we don't always agree with maybe some of the decisions that the, the department makes and we do challenge on a regular basis, but that's all in the best interests of the sector to ensure that the sector's interests are, are represented. I assume everybody here today has received a copy of our respective submissions. So I don't intend to go into the submissions in any great detail. Uh, if you have any questions in relation to those submissions, I would quite <coughs> willingly engage with those uh, individuals either during the, the, the session or afterwards. Um, there's a couple of things or a few things that I want to set out at the outset that I feel are relatively important at this moment in time. In relation to our engagement with the department, um, there has been engagement, but in my opinion, it hasn't been meaningful and effective engagement. We do receive correspondence uh, from the department, and we do receive telephone calls from the department, but it's, it's, it's them talking to us as opposed to them actually engaging with us to see what uh, the solutions are and how the industry feels. So I'd welcome more meaningful engagement with the department going forward. We also need more clarity. The department has made quite a number of announcements in relation to the relaxations, etc., but it lacks sufficient detail. And we need more clarity when the minister makes a statement or an, uh, subsequent uh, information provided to the sector. Uh, there's insufficient detail. I'll give you one example where the minister has made an announcement in relation to roadworthiness test certificates, the 12 month relaxation. I had two pieces of correspondence from members yesterday in relation to that particular relaxation, where I had briefed them to say that it was a 12 months relaxation. The members come back to say that in actual fact it wasn't a 12 month relaxation, that they had received correspondence from the department to say it was only three months. So I had to challenge the department again in relation to get clarity, and it transpires it is 12 months, but they can only give it in three month allocations. So there's a 12 month exemption, they'll give the three months initially and then the next three months and then the next three months and then the next three months. And, and the alleged that this is to do with the legislation all bit. I've read the legislation and I can't see any stipulation where it says three months. In addition to that, we also need speedier and more decisive action on some of the key issues. Most people will be aware there's been an issue in relation to HGV medical and driver license renewals. This is an issue that we have been lobbying uh, the department for since middle of March. And uh, GB uh, made an announcement in relation to a relaxation for 12 months. And uh, the, the Minister in Northern Ireland 
had an announcement whereby she had an agreement with uh, local GPs that they would prioritise medical appointments. Uh, feedback from the industry was that this wasn't happening in reality and caused considerable confusion. Most people thought whenever the announcement was made in GB, it applied to the whole of the UK, whereas, as we know, it, it didn't. So we need speedier action to follow the GB lead in relation to exemptions such as this. And again, I say we need some engagement. There was no real engagement in relation to what the department were proposing in respect of this particular uh, relaxation. Uh, financial support package. It's a serious issue within the sector. Some, some elements of the sector are surviving quite well in that if they're involved in the food supply chain and they've got loads to GB and return loads. Uh, I know of some big operators who are actually hiring in additional um, capacity to cope. There's other operators, and I was speaking to one yesterday. He has a fleet, uh, a mixed fleet. He has £6 million worth of vehicles parked up. Uh, these, these are all relatively new vehicles. The depreciation <coughs> in those vehicles alone are in the region of £100,000 per month. He's had them parked up for three months. So there's over £300,000 that he's lost in value of those vehicles. And that's not taken into consideration the income that he's lost. So a support package, albeit it's, it's, it is very late in the day, it is necessary and we need to get our heads together to see what we can uh, provide. I know there was some announcement by uh, Minister Murphy in, in the House in relation to a, a package not being necessary, but I find that very, very surprising. And, and certainly there's been no meaningful engagement with the sector in Northern Ireland, or with me in any case, in relation to what type of package would be suitable or what would address the concerns of, of the industry. There's a range of other issues um, going forward that would be of concern to us. Ferry companies, the industry had an agreement with the ferry companies in relation to a fuel surcharge. And in essence, without going into the detail, the fuel surcharge was agreed whereby it would track the world of oil prices. As everyone knows, oil prices has come down and is quite welcome, but the ferry companies haven't honoured their contract. And this is costing the Northern Irish economy in the region of 17 to 23 million pounds a year. And that's when you're looking at the ferry, um, the ferry movements between Northern Ireland and GB. There's one particular operator and it's costing him nearly a million pounds in a 12 month period. So this is significant amounts of money. Whenever the industry is on its knees and can ill afford to pay the ferry companies, and the ferry companies have got support because their volumes are down, but they're getting it both ways. They're getting it from government funding and they're getting additional surcharges. Uh, another concern in relation to the department is they haven't reintroduced public inquiries or hearings. Uh, and I appreciate everyone's under enough pressure with the pandemic. However, there's quite a number of operators who have had inquiries outstanding for years. This is stifling their business plans. They're unable to increase the size of their fleets. And in addition to that, you have operators who are let's say, operating illegally, and they're not being challenged and taken out of the system. So it's creating unfair competition during a period whenever we can ill afford unfair competition. In addition to that, uh, we have requested the department to look at introducing driver conduct hearings. And this is where professional HGV drivers and bus drivers, if there's an issue in relation to the conduct, uh, the department can look at their conduct to see if they should be permitted to carry on in the sector. The department's of the opinion that there's no uh, varies or no legal authority to do that. Uh, I would say that there is, and it's Article 71 of the Road Traffic Order in 1981, so there is varies. However, there's a lack of will to address this particular issue. And lastly, in relation to trying to work our way out of this pandemic, uh, the RHA have tabled a paper to central government and Westminster in relation to a, a number of key asks. Uh, this, this paper was uh, supported by a number of other leading associations, 
and there's five key asks that would address a lot of the financial pressures if some or all of these were introduced uh, by central government and maybe supported by the local executive. And they include invoice factoring agreements, weekly furlough scheme, which I believe may be introduced, COVID recovery fuel duty suspension or rebate scheme, 100% rates relief, and a lorry retention support scheme. So, in other words, a financial support scheme for any operator who has his vehicles parked up. And, and that's all I want to add at this moment in time. Okay, thank you. Seamus? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Deputy Chair, and members of the, the committee, uh, thanks very much for the invitation today. Um, really welcome, um, first of all, basically your engagement today, um, but not just today. I think in the last few weeks and months, I um, really appreciate the emails, the phone calls, the Zoom calls with many members of the committee here. Um, it, it's really appreciated. Uh, I think maybe you know some of the positives that's going to come out of this crisis is that I think there's a better understanding of logistics and how transport and supply chains work. I think a lot of people in the general public didn't understand how goods got from A to B. And I think basically we have to build on this as well. Um, I will touch on the planning for recovery, but how we come out of this. Um, but engagement with the department, um, it has been relatively positive um, to date. Um, I think the problem, uh, if I give you an, an example, it's where um, the Department for Transport in London, they are the, they take the lead on, on member state level engagement with EU legislation. So to give you an example, um, we obviously had you know, the, the relaxations and driver's hours rules and, and they were done basically in, in incremental steps. So when we look at something like um, the first step the minister was able to give us, um, we had a lot of members, because members of mine are not just engaged in haulage, but they're in manufacturing, retail, anyone who's involved in, in, in logistics. So the first step that the minister was able to give us was a relaxation on the curfews of delivery hours to stores. And that's what, because you know, some of our members are some of the largest retailers in the country here, and they were maybe stuck where maybe a lorry couldn't go to a shop maybe after 8 p.m. at night or before 7 a.m. in the morning, etc. So that was, that was a good first step. But then when we looked at the driver's hours relaxations, um, Thursday the 19th of March, uh, the department here, they confirmed a relaxation on driver's hours for the deliveries of retail-related goods only. So that was a good, good first step, but it didn't solve the entire problem. So then on Friday the 20th, the DFI then relaxed the driving hours rules for the deliveries of oil and solid fuels to business and domestic. And we still weren't there yet. There was still more because we needed a blanket relaxation for all drivers. And then what actually happened on Saturday the 21st of March, um, without consultation with the Department for Infrastructure here, DFT in London issued a blanket relaxation of driver's hours rules for Great Britain without any engagement or, or forewarning to the department here. So that led to me on a Saturday morning, basically multiple phone calls uh, on that morning, and it left basically the department here having to react to this change quickly. Uh, to their credit, the work during that morning, by lunchtime, the situation was resolved. But it showed basically how we were reliant on third parties for us to adapt and make changes for it, which is unique circumstances for us. So th this obviously leads, uh, it's because DFT take the lead in such EU legislation, and maybe one thing we have to look at going further, and after the transition period of exit in the EU, I think it's something that the Department for Infrastructure has to look here, how we can make those decisions independently in the future, because we have to learn from this process as well, without relying on other people making that step first. So that there's, um, on the driving hours rules now, um, uh, there, there was a, a call for evidence from department officials there recently um, asking if we needed the relaxation. I put it out to industry and I suppose a, a good reflection on where we are now is that no members requested the relaxations to extend beyond uh, the end of May. Um, so businesses is starting to go, the volumes are starting to go back and we've seen the reduction. Obviously there's no more panic buying anymore and supply chains are just kind of flattening out again. So. That's good on that side of things. Um, where we are now, probably with the plan for recovery, it's where people have got through this crisis period, but it's survival in the long run. And a lot of people, and I think generally maybe between media, uh, politics and industry, people are saying, well, there's no casualties yet, and specifically in the haulage sector, why are no businesses gone under yet? 
And it's because it's down to a couple of things. The furlough scheme has been a lifesaver for a lot of businesses. Um, I, I, know, I know many operators here maybe have up to 75% of their drivers on furlough, others on half. Um, so that's, that's been great. But the problem is it's not flexible. Um, the, 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 the workloads at the moment are inconsistent. So if I've got a driver on furlough, you have to have them on, on the three-week period before you can put, call them back again. So that, that ability to adapt. Um, so if I've got enough work for a driver two days of the week, um, there's no point in me taking them back full time because they're going to be sitting idle for, for the remainder of the week. So what we've got, you know, what John referred to there as well, you know, we've made the call to government as well. We need a, a flexible furlough scheme. Um, specifically, you know, it could be across other sectors as well, but I know for logistics, it would just give those businesses where they're striving to get back to their full capacity, but they're not going to get there yet for months to come yet. Um, it just means where we can gradually wean people off the furlough scheme and the reliance on that. Um, where we're going to see basically uh, the most important is obviously going to be restarting the demand in the economy here because as a service sector and logistics, you know, we're reliant on other sectors getting back to business as normal as quickly as possible. So what the executive has to do here is looking at extending the scope of businesses able to function as long as they can implement the social distancing. Uh, and one example of that, you know, supermarkets have been able to demonstrate they can implement social distancing. So obviously, we're supporting other sectors that, you know, general high street stores, shopping centres, can also reopen as long as they can comply with the, those safety regulations. Because selling the current stock that will enable the flow of goods to resume and more of the logistics industry to function. And the big problem, I suppose, for Northern Ireland at the moment with logistics is that trade imbalance with Great Britain, where the agri-food sector, a lot of hauliers here have been fully laden on vehicles going out to GB, uh, because agri-food is one of our biggest exports to the GB market. But that same haulier, pre-COVID, they may have been reliant on taking back maybe fashion retail, electrical, homeware items. And because of lockdown, they simply didn't have that. So I spoke to one haulier last week. Um, they did have enough business to run 100% as normal to GB, but they were saying we will only be taking 70% now because at the day I spoke to them, they had close to about 20 vehicles parked up in England with drivers waiting to get a phone call to lift a load to come back to Northern Ireland, and that's costing money. Um, the operating cost for a 44-ton truck is one pound a minute when you're operating them, so to be driving empty anywhere, you're burning money. And you've got to try, you, you know, margins are so fine to try and get that back. It's very difficult. So we're reliant on, on industry coming out of the lockdown. The sequencing of return to business and productivity is going to be hugely important in avoiding the future trade imbalances. Because again, if, if GB starts going into uh, lifting out of lockdown sooner or later than us, sort of sequence, that affects that, 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 that trade across the Irish Sea as well. Um, Coming out of these here things, we're looking at um, some of the road regulations. These are, you know, a lot of the things that the, the department have done for us around testing. You know, it was kind of funny yesterday, you know, when we got the announcement from the minister yesterday of IVA, ADR and licensing, I just thought to myself, well, that's half of my agenda wiped out for today because they were some of the big issues. IVA, it, it kind of went, I think the driver licensing story um, got the headlines, certainly in the media, but IVA for us was the bigger picture. Um, one member I spoke to last week, they, were, um, they had one and a half million pounds worth of business parked up that they just couldn't complete because of no IVA. Um, the NHS are members of ours. They had 29 vehicles, as you know, I sent you that there, that they, they couldn't purchase and put into, into use. And I could go on and on with, 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 with regulations, and all, but that was the key for us. And I suppose the concern going forward is that there will be a backlog. You know, at best, we'll have IVA taking place at three test centres, and there will be a backload. And we're obviously, we're going to have to prioritise. So, you know, we are looking about maybe vehicles maybe involved in health um, and, and, and food logistics and fuel getting priority. But obviously, we don't want to see any businesses getting impacted because there's an impact on those manufacturers as well. Um, when we look at some of the things as well regarding um, vehicle safety, so obviously the HGV light vehicle test and the 12-month ex extension of the test certificates um, have been issued. I suppose the issue for us in 12 months' time, test demand will almost be twice as normal in this year. We're going to have the rollover and then vehicles that are coming onto the system as well. So there's going to have to be a process to relieve the pressure. And I imagine the department here and working with its staff and unions, etc., are going to have to work out how we're going to deal with that um, headache when we get there. Um, 
Industry and the government are going to have to work together to ensure fleets are proactively maintained and, and safety inspected in the absence of the annual test as well. So that's one thing we're saying to people. You know, just because you don't have the MOT now, it doesn't mean you take your eye off the ball. You know, safety is still paramount for us. So it's one thing we're, we're consistently pushing. We do carry out that for our members. We have our own engineers. We go out there and we'll do the safety inspections on fleets. And I know in GB, when we're seeing the sector coming out of lockdown now, a lot of people are uh, employing like pre-use checks of vehicles that might have been parked up for eight weeks, just to make sure they're safe for use in the road again. Um, Going on, and the, on, when we come out of this as well, I mentioned about basically how a lot of companies, um, you know, the financial issues won't come to the fore um, in the future, and probably in the early autumn time, we're going to have vehicles. You know, again, John pointed out the the, the financial um, commitment with with operating vehicles. You're looking maybe around about five hundred pound a week on a finance deal for a lorry, and if you've got a hundred trucks, that's a lot of money for those trucks to be doing nothing. Um, so what we're going to see, basically, a lot of these hauliers, they've been given maybe um, payment holidays by their lenders. So, for example, if I've been given a three-month holiday on finance, that's all fair and well. But the end date of that contract hasn't been pushed forward three months. The expiry date stays the same in the contract. So it means when I go back to business, the usual, in August or September, my outgoings, my expenditure has increased dramatically. And more than likely, because we're probably going to enter a severe recession, the income isn't going to be there pre-COVID. And that is when we're going to see a lot of the difficulty matched with us. And then coming out of that, coming along with um, exit and furlough schemes as well, that's probably where we're going to see the, the, the highest pressure for businesses. So I suppose what we're going to have to look at, and the department will play a role here, is like the insolvency processes I'm involved around operator licensing, because some companies will fail during the, per during the period later in this year. So the processes, you know, they, they have to be um, they have to be able to to let these operators recover quickly. So, for example, the UK law uh, UK law allows owners, directors, and employees of insolvent companies to set up new companies to carry out to carry on a similar business, uh, as long as those individuals involved aren't uh, personally bankrupt or disqualified from 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 acting in the management of such a such a company. So. Um, what we're going to have to look at, basically, for operator licenses, and what this means is it's the demonstrating repute. When you apply for an operator's license, this could be harder for those people. If, if I'm a genuine, you know, good operator, and through no fault of my own, but between, because of COVID and the impact on my client base that it has, I've gone out of business through no fault of my own. Technically, on today's protocol, it would be harder for me, um, following bankruptcy or liquidation, to get another uh, operator's license to start up another business again. So what we're going to have to do, basically, remedies are going to have to be uh, look at basically about how the Transport Regulation Unit here, how they reconsider um, the requirements of who's fit to, to have an operator's license again, and the assessment around this as well. That could focus on whether the repute was evident before COVID. So these things have to be taken in consideration. If I'm a good operator, there was no issues with compliance, financials pre-COVID. I think the department really has to facilitate a quick turnaround in these applications, just so these people can lift themselves up again off the ground. Uh, and really, um, on the last point, you know, it, it's that um, that connectivity, um, not just really between around Northern Ireland, the island of Ireland, Great Britain, and Europe. Um, but it's the, the ability to get goods there. And the government, you know, I can appreciate, it's one thing we called for. We did support um, the subsidising of ferries and ports because what those ferries do for us, they're, they're ultimately a bridge. If a, if, a, if a ferry company decided to berth their ships tomorrow and not operate, we'd be snookered on how we move most of the goods here. Um, Bel same goes for Belfast International Airport. You know, they've had money. Um, they're looking at about, they have about 16 aircraft movements every night involving air freight. Um, they're members of ours, hugely important. Um, you know, they've got some aid along with the ferry companies. That's all fair and well. But I think it's very difficult for some hauliers to, to stomach um, where there is no aid for their industry. Um, a lot of them have found it very difficult to apply like for Sybil's, um, the, the loan scheme. Um, but they're seeing basically some of the companies that they pay money to obviously getting this government aid. So I think there obviously there needs to be um, a great transparency um, about how companies charge. Hauliers, um, I think what we have with this trade imbalance, which I outlined earlier, there's a lot of empty running. There's a lot of trailers coming back to Northern Ireland empty, but they're still paying the fees that they've always paid for those trailers coming across. So, you know, in, in discussions I've had with the department here, 
with the Department for Economy. I've, I've given the, the Economy Minister a briefing on the impact of this, and also I've had discussions with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on this as well, is that I think that the industry here needs to see some, um, uh, some, some fairness and some transparency about how um, fuel is charged, for example, on ferry crossings. Uh, and what we've seen this year is basically that, um, you know, prior to my job in FTI, I worked in shipping, but it was in container shipping. A fuel surcharge is a massive element, and the benefit of a fuel surcharge is that, for example, if I charge you £300 to ship a trailer across the Irish Sea, to make sure that that, that fare uh, is going to be fair and sustainable, I will take the, the fuel element out of that and charge it separately. So, for example, I will charge you £50 for the fuel, and every month we reevaluate that that fifty pound based on the global price of oil, and that would fluctuate up and down. And what that meant is that a haulier would then go to their customer, could be a manufacturer, a food producer, and say, "Here's what I can move your goods for." And also this fuel adjustment factor. There's no profit made on this. You can see what the shipping company is charging me. You will then pay that on top of the fare. And everyone was pretty good with that. But th at the end of last year, what happened is that the three ferry companies operating on the Irish Sea here. Um, took that bath, that, that fuel surcharge, and put it into the base shipping rate. And then a new low sulfur fuel surcharge was incorporated from the 1st of January because ships have to use a cleaner fuel. But what that did, it gave a buffer, basically it protected that if there was an increase in global fuel prices, it meant it could be put on that low sulfur charge. So I think what's difficult for some hauliers, they see that this fuel surcharge, it was meant there to protect both parties, has gone into the baseline rate, and obviously with fuel prices going down, they're not seeing the benefit of that. So that, that's something probably we would see. And from, from our understanding, DFT and discussions with the NIO, uh, a lot of the funding for shipping companies hasn't um, been paid yet, or it, it's still in a process, it, it, it's a rolling process. And that, that will be looked at, and it'll be something that you know, would be a great deal if, if the committee can help with and pursue that as well. So that really sums it up for now on me. There's a lot of issues here, but I think the big <coughs> obstacle for us <clears throat> it's not today. We're through most of the issues now, but it, it's coming out of this here, COVID, and, and how we get through that, and obviously the ultimate um, financial pressures from a recession. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are restricted for time, and most members have indicated, so I, I'll, I'll just restrict myself to one question, but obviously don't want to interrupt the flow of conversation either, because there are a lot of issues <coughs> here which are very important. I suppose really, um, as, as you say, a number of the things that you were, you were dealing with us at the very beginning have now been sorted in relation the majority of issues around sort of weights and so on have been resolved. There's maybe one exception to that. Um, the focus very much then moved then to the trade imbalance, as you say, and there was quite a lot of media coverage in regards to perhaps there may be an issue in relation to food supply and so on as well, which then highlighted the concerns with regards to hauliers. But I suppose really the, the broader um, haulage industry perhaps was maybe overlooked because not everyone is um, transporting um, food supplies or even going across the water either. Um, uh, last week's announcement, I suppose, in the debate or the statement by the finance minister came as a bit of a surprise to us in the fact that um, conversations seemingly had concluded that no intervention was, was required for hauliers. Seamus, you've indicated that you have had a number of conversations in relation to that. Were you aware um, that no support package was, was going to be coming to the table? No, all, all our work um, between with the Department for Infrastructure, Department for Economy, uh, was given information to DFT and Treasury. So our efforts have been focused on that up until recently. Um, DFT were supportive of this up until recently, um, but we knew the, the evidence threshold was, was const constantly being um, raised by Treasury for a sector-specific package on this. Um, and it only just came to us when the minister made the announcement last week then that um, that there was no basically there was going to be no aid package forthcoming from from Treasury on this. Um, but I suppose what we have to look at is that that there is money in a pot there. There's 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 59 million pound here locally <coughs> that we probably need to look at um, and, and how that can be fairly um, distributed to those companies in need because not every business is in the the same boat as such. There are some businesses that have been relatively unaffected. Some have actually seen a lift in trade. And it all came down to the lottery, basically, of who your client base was and what you were moving. Whereas there's other people there, and they're literally on their knees. There's some hauliers there have seen 90% of their trade 
um, vanish. So, so this package, you know, like I said, you know, I, I've given, you know, I, I, I wrote a paper obviously for the economy minister, and the economy minister actually um, used this in briefings with uh, the chancellor uh, and, and ministers at DFT as well, and it out outlined the exact pressures that trade imbalance was having on Northern Ireland. So, our efforts were on that, but it appears now that. Um, we've been left to our own devices in Northern Ireland about how we protect the industry here, um, because it doesn't appear there's going to be support forthcoming from London on this. And I, I, I would sort of put a little bit of caution in relation to the £59 million, because obviously that's for, for transport yeah. overall, um, <clears throat> and there are massive pressures obviously in relation to TransLink as well, so that would be my concern in that this money may have already been spent, although not announced to be spent, so we're not really sure as to where that money sits at, at, this, mo at this moment in time. Uh, John, you had a plan to have um, a representative from Woodsides here today, and that would have been useful actually to have heard from a company directly. Um, had, I mean, what, what were you getting from them as a, as, a, as, a, as a major concern? And in the absence of a package, really what would ease their burden moving through this? Well, Woodside, Woodside's have a number of different aspects to their business. The one that's been affected the most is the car transport end of it. They say they have £6 million worth of plant that's parked up. And their difficulty is you know, car showrooms may open up. I think there is some um, consideration being given to car showrooms being opening up. But it's whether the car trade will pick up again sufficiently for them to put that fleet back into to operation. So it's the amount of money that they're actually losing. And the longer it goes on, the bigger the impact and the less able they are to cope with it. But to say Woodside's other side of the business in relation to the general freight, uh, household stuff, um, uh, food supply and st stuff, is generally strong. So they're able to buffer it slightly because of the other aspects they have in their business portfolio. But there is a number of other companies whose entire fleets uh, we have a number of members who service the, the retail clothing sector, and their entire fleets are parked up and have been since day one. And you know, they're they're working on their reserves, and the reserves is rapidly running out. But then again, you have other companies who have lost the backloads, uh, and these companies they're trying to service the food supply chain, but in doing that, they're actually hemorrhaging their losses because it takes more, as Seamus says, to operate a vehicle than it does if you park it up. So there's, there's so many different angles and aspects to the problem. One, one, one solution won't solve everybody's problem. There is, because of the additional ferry journeys Northern Ireland's operators have to uh, uh, use, you know, there is something that maybe the local executive could look at in relation to supporting uh, ferry journeys the empty ferry journeys, and that can all be audited. But it's a matter of you know, people from the executive or people from the various departments sitting down with the industry and looking to see exactly what the issues are. We have tabled proposals to central government, have tabled proposals to the, the economy minister and the infrastructure minister, but, but there's really nothing been coming back. And I say the sector is now um, frustrated that everybody else seems to have got support and because they are continuing to try to service the food chain in particular uh, there is a perception maybe out there that everything everything's okay which is not the case okay. thank you mr Boylan. thank you chair and thank you very much for your presentations well, ju just quickly because I, I mean try and identify where responsibility lies and obviously i don't think anybody in the committee wouldn't support any proposal put on the table in terms of the regulatory regime, where does all the responsibility lie in all of this? Is it partly in DFA, partly DFT? Or? Um, transport in Northern Ireland is generally a devolved matter. Uh, the vast majority of transport responsibility sits with DFA. And I say that comes from I worked in DFA, so I have an in-depth knowledge of what their responsibilities are. So the vast majority of it sits with DFA. There is some ADR. Um, the carriage of dangerous goods sits within the Department for the Economy, but it's largely DFI. Okay, so in some of the issues, because same as you mentioned, some of the technical and compliance issues, that's that's a different argument when we yes. can be talking about. So it's just to clear that up. Um, and I know in relation to the medicals, and we heard information just because we've been dealing with a lot of HCV drivers who couldn't get medicals, and the MA had said, you know, yes. contact your GP and all that, but that's 
how that's resolved. But but my main point would be, or there's two main points. One, the communication element, and we need to we need to look at that because clearly that's between DVA and yourselves, right across the board. There seems to be a communication or lack of communication, and we would su certainly support it as a committee to try and tighten that up or yes. whatever we can do to to improve that engagement. Um, just if you have some ideas on that. And also the main one, and, and I think this is a very important one. Um, what would the proposal, um, or what would like a package or a proposal look like in terms of fi financial package, or who, who needs to be involved in all that to bring the proposal forward? To support the industry? I, need well, well, I, th I think all the associations, which is the RHA, the FTA, CILT, plus the Department for the Economy. Uh, DFI, because DFI would hold all the relevant uh, information, and potentially in relation to vehicles that have been sorned, it would be DFT or DVLA who would have the information in relation to what vehicles are parked up. But I say a one, a one solution doesn't fit all of the problems. There's, there's so many different, it's multifaceted. Uh, but I say it's a matter of getting everybody around. Uh, excuse the, the term, the, getting around the table in a Zoom conference or something like that to, to talk through the issues, but I, I, I feel that that hasn't happened, and that's one of the issues that needs to happen, is to get the issues out onto the table and to thrash out what the needs of the sector are and what would address the issues. Because coming out of the pandemic, if we don't have a fully functioning um, freight sector, particularly in, in Ireland, where you have an all-island economy, if the freight sector is near to service, uh, uh, manufacturing, etc., then the whole economy will suffer. In terms of financial package, I mean. yeah, there, there's no there's no one size fits all because some people um, focus on maybe the the cross channel trade, but you know there's operators here that don't send any lorries um, across the Irish Sea, um, but they maybe rely, let's say, on the hospitality trade for movement of goods, and because of that shutdown. Um, those operators are as a, in as a much financial difficulty as the hauliers who are doing cross-channel work. Um, you probably have to take on, con you know, there would have to be some type of criteria uh, to determine who is going to be um, eligible for any type of um, financial hardship uh, aid. Um, you're probably going to look at the number of vehicles that has been sorned off the road, how many drivers have been furloughed, and then taken on, on board um, the, 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 their income. Basically, you know, their, their profit and loss for this period. And, and would any of that data lay within some of the departments as cross departmental? Well, in, in, in relation to the, the fleet size, D, uh, the TRU, which is uh, a branch of the DFI, would have all the information in relation to vehicle fleets. They could access all the drivers' hours uh, records in relation to if the fleets have moved during a specific period of time, so that could be tied in with it. And then DVLA in relation to motor tax. Uh, most companies who have parked their fleets up will sorn their vehicles to avail of the rebate in relation to vehicle excise or tax. So there would have to be some liaison with DVLA in relation to uh, vehicles. Have they actually been parked up? So there would be a lot of people around the table uh, providing a lot of information to put it together to see if someone's making a claim, if it's justified. It has to be obviously auditable. Uh, so it does. But so, so something quite simple, uh, Cackle, something quite simple in relation to um, fuel rebate. A fuel rebate type scheme could provide some support. Or a scheme to supply, uh, a scheme in relation to empty running on, on the ferries could provide support. And that's all audible. Those type of proposals were tabled to the Economy Minister and to the DFI Minister. But we, we didn't receive the feedback or the engagement that we would have expected to explore how that would work and to explore the benefits uh, to the sector. And just finally, so the Treasury issue is finished. James, you don't see the, the discussions with the Treasury in relation to bringing the package. There's no other option than that. Is that, is that the whole debate finished? Not, not in the short term. I think um, there, there was serious discussions um, until a few weeks ago involving um, DEFRA because they considered, um, you know, if, if companies started going under a threat to the, the supply of food across the UK, 
um, and that obviously was aiding the initiative of DFT um, lobbying for support for the industry. Um, but because that has eased that pressure now, I think Treasury's attention is, is elsewhere. Certainly, okay. if I can maybe add comment. Uh, the time. So. That's okay. That's fine. Right. Uh, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, to be very brief, uh, conscious of the time, um, I'm disappointed to hear about the experiences some have been reported with the department. Um, in terms of engaging with the Department of Infrastructure, my own experience has been in being able to get timely responses. Um, in engaging with other departments, it's been like banging my head off the wall. I've still got a question needing to be answered from the Department of the Economy around support for the taxi industry and about social distancing. So there's a, a contrast between different departments around that. Two very quick questions. Uh, in relation to the support package, what is the time scale for which this needs to be brought forward? If the Department of Transport in London is not prepared to bring forward a package, I think we have to bring forward a package here in Northern Ireland. So what's the time scales for which we need to bring that forward and the implications if that doesn't happen? And the second one is the obviously the ongoing discussions are taking place in relation to the uh, EU exit. Um, it's looking unfortunately increasingly likely that we'll be leaving without a free trade uh, deal. Uh, what are the implications of the Northern Ireland Protocol upon your industry in the context of the challenges you've already outlined here uh, in relation to COVID-19? Um, what would the challenges be in terms of implementation of that protocol? Probably, Andrew, um, an aid package, um, some, like I alluded to earlier, I think some operators will need this um, before the end of the, the summer, if not sooner, um, because once finance payments kick in again on fleets and we see maybe the furlough scheme um, dropping off, basically with support, not unless we get a flexible furlough scheme, that will apply pressure. So I think really time's of the essence in this for some operators. Um, I know, I know you've, you've spoken to different businesses in the sector as well, and they've outlined those concerns. So I would say, you know, sooner rather than later on this, certainly before, before middle or end of the summer. The, the RHA done a survey of upwards of 6,000 uh, operators, both members and non-members. And in essence, what it reflects is that 50% of the sector will be in serious financial difficulties within, within one month. One month? One month. So, you know, uh, a package is long overdue. The difficulty is if we don't have anything to support the industry, it's we won't have uh, an industry to support the economy once it restarts. And particularly within Northern Ireland, where we export a lot of stuff, the agri food sector, uh, if we don't have the sector in place, then it'll impact the whole economy. So, well. on the protocol? On the protocol, um, we're getting there probably um, a bit of positivity. Last week, there was an acknowledgement that there is a problem there to solve through the UK's command paper on the, on the protocol. Um, it did acknowledge SPS controls the enhancement of those facilities. Um, what we don't know yet, we don't know yet about um, the type of IT system um, that we're going to have to need are the exact formalities. And there, there was a bit of vagueness around, um, there was no mention of export health certificates because what the paper actually outlined to begin with, it put all the burden of the formalities on the Northern Ireland side of trade. They would have to do, it said, they would have to do the import declarations, they would have to do safety security declarations and so on. No mention of safety security has to be done before the good ship and export health certificates. So there's still a lot there um, to, to happen. And I suppose with capacity, we don't have enough staff, people in the industry, to facilitate um, a lot of the red taper formalities with this. There was actually um, the Department for Economy um, carried out an independent study um, just around January, February time. There's a copy of it here. It's on, it's on their website. And uh, the, 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 the key finding actually said, it said, most service providers are adopting a wait and see policy until they have greater clarity to the actual implications Brexit will have in the local economy. Um, it just says they require guidance from government. And right now, a lot of that guidance, guidance and, and clarity has not been forthcoming. And literally, people are taking a wait and see approach. And, and finally, the Re Department for Economy said recruitment of these staff would need to commence in the first half of 2020 to be ready. <laughs> well, I think because of COVID-19, a lot of people were adopting their approach of wait and see. COVID-19 has taken over. And if you have a lot of staff furloughed, you have nobody to consider the implications of, of the end of the transition period. And, and that's provided government was providing the clarity, but we haven't got the clarity. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. You're very welcome, gentlemen. Uh, 
Both of you mentioned the issue with the ferry companies and the, the fuel surcharges. Uh, I think yourself, uh, John, indicated some very significant figures there. Where is that lobby? Is, is that completed? There's no chance of that being further discussed. As they basically said no one. I know it must be very frustrating because obviously the ferries are getting some funding and whatnot. But it's, it's, is there still a negotiation to take place there, or is it just a dead subject? Well, based on our discussions with uh, a number of the ferry companies, they're saying it's not up for discussion, it's not up for negotiation. They come back formally in writing to say that, that that's it. We have our own costs to, to, to meet, and uh, this goes towards meeting our costs, because obviously volumes have dropped considerably in relation to um, tourism and food passengers, so they're saying that there's no scope. But they say they have got funding, or are in, the, in line for funding from, from government. Now, whether that will make any impact or not, I'm not too sure, but they're saying at this moment in time, no. lobby department or anything, maybe, to take an angle on it themselves? I have raised it both with the Department for the Economy and the Department for Infrastructure, and it's been raised with DFT, who are my colleagues in GB, to see if there's any uh, uh, any chance of it being escalated to a higher level, yeah. uh, but it, there's, there's no feedback yet. But I say the, the ferry companies are saying no, it's not up for negotiation. Okay, and just finally, the, the lack of communication uh, from the department is it uh, is that something that was before uh, the pandemic? Was that a problem before? The situation we find ourselves in. There, or? Part of the problem is it's, it's effective communi communication in that they will phone me on occasions and they will try to discuss sessions. I'll give you one example in relation to vehicle weights. I was representing a member in relation to vehicle weights. Um, an official of the department phoned me and was explaining the process and the regulations in relation to vehicle weights. And I was explaining the GB setup. And if I was a normal member of the public or the sector, I wouldn't have understood the subtle differences. So whenever I challenged him in relation to the way it was in Northern Ireland, he, he, he basically dried up and didn't want. So I, I find part of the difficulty with effective engagement with me is because I know as much or maybe more than the individuals. So there's maybe a fear factor. But I, to me, that shouldn't be an issue. We're in it together for the benefit of the industry. Um, I, I have no difficulty educating people at the other side of the table because I was at the other side of the table. So I have no difficulty, but it's, there seems to be a reluctance to effectively engage. And I say, whenever the decision was made in relation to the vehicle weights, there was no discussion. There was no engagement. The decision came out, and that was it. And I tried phoning them. Nobody was in the office. I sent an email, and there was no answer. Okay, that's on the committee again. Take on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, Seamus, John, thank you for your presentation so far. I'm looking at a paper here, John, the Road Haulage Association paper pick produced by ourselves on the 30th of April with, a, as I call it, the five asks on it. Yes. Are you two gentlemen and organisations on the same page with those asks, and have they changed from the 30th of April, which is only practically a month ago? Are they the same five asks you're asking for? And is that the same asks on the Atlanta Department of Economy here? We, we have submitted this paper to the Department for the Economy and to um, the Department for Infrastructure. Uh, same paper? The same paper, yeah. All I can say is this, this paper was submitted to um, central government. It was supported by a number of uh, leading trade organisations. There's a letter, I think, attached to that. Um, I, I can't comment in, in relation to the FTA, but certainly most of the organisations signed up to this as an agreed way forward for the government to consider. Five, yes. And what feedback have you got? I'll come to you in a minute, Seamus, in regard to those five, as in indicating on each one individually? Or? Uh, the feedback that we've got from central government is that DFT, and I say, as Seamus has already alluded to, there was a lack of understanding yeah. in relation to the complexity and how finely balanced uh, the, the logistics sector is. But, DFT uh, now appreciate that, and DFT support some form of intervention, but uh, DFT have to influence the Chancellor, and, and I think the difficulty is in relation to where will the funds come from, because there's so much uh, being paid out by, by central government. It's, it's, and I'm not trying to get used to gentlemen, obviously, in different camps, but it's, yeah. is, the, is the five points similar? 
I think the points uh, um, are, are fairly similar. You know, ours focused, you know, our, our key asks were on the flexi furlough, um, which I think other bodies have. Um, we want a, a, a sympathetic repayment scheme for the Sybils, like almost put into a student loan system we've asked for. So you start paying back the Sybils loan um, in, 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 in tandem with basically your, your profits as you, your business goes back into profits again. I think the one area um, we initially looked at, um, obviously, the, the, the fuel duty issue. Um, but when we spoke to membership, um, uh, you know, given a rebate or not charging fuel duty on operators, that was a benefit to operators who were viable and carrying business. But it didn't give any um, tangible benefit to people who had vehicles parked up or struggling. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Beggs. Again, thanks, thanks for your presentation and uh, an understanding to a degree of what, what's happening out there. One of the points being made is the lack of engagement uh, from the department officials in, in the needs of industry. And when I hear what's going on um, in a range of areas, IVA, yes, we've, we've, we're now starting to uh, inspect vehicles, uh, individual vehicle assessments, uh, but there's going to be a backlog, you're saying? Um, Drivers, and that happened uh, the 17, 27th of April in England, or GB, a month ago. We've been slow to react. The drivers' licences, again, there was a one-year extension in GB. We're waiting on EU regulations to give a seven-month extension, and that can very quickly be a problem as well, unless other things change. So where I'm coming to, and then, and then you mentioned actually the issue of, of uh, public inquiries into uh, illegal operators who are not uh, operating correctly. So where I'm coming to is, what is wrong with our department? There is not the engagement with the needs of industry to meet the needs of in industry and react much quicker. My, my, my professional opinion is that there's a lack of staff within the department who have the requisite skills, knowledge and experience in order to make these decisions or to take these issues forward. Have any of the officials actually ever worked in the industry, the other side of the table, or are they all, you know, Capsworth? Largely, the officials are administrative civil servants. You have one or two specialist people, but I anticipate whenever they retire that they won't be replaced with people with industry experience. And to be quite honest, that's one of the key problems within the department is that they don't have officials with the requisite insight. And I would have classed myself as a person who had an insight into the sector, and yet whenever I stepped out from being in the civil service for 33 years into the, into the private sector, uh, I got my eyes open in relation to how complex, how finely balanced, and how difficult it is to manage a modern logistics company in today's uh, world. And that's not taken into consideration Brexit and the pandemic. Madam Chair, going forward, I think this is an important issue, a wider issue that we as a committee need to take up with the department. Yeah. Anything further? That's it. Okay, thank you. Ms Kimmins? Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Seamus and John, um, for, for your briefing. Um, just, there's just two points, I suppose, uh, and a number of, of members have said there, um, you know, the disappointment and the lack of engagement from the department. And you had alluded to the comments from the Finance Minister, but I think that was in response to the tre Treasury. Um, I think it's important, and maybe as a committee, we need to, 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 to write to the Minister and say that there needs to be urgent engagement with the sector here to bring forward a proposition to the Finance Minister, because, and, and, you know, and, and he made this very clear yesterday, it's not his role to bring propositions forward. He, the, the, department, the relevant departments should be bringing them to him, costed, and, you know, to say what, what is needed to support those sectors. As you said, John, yourself, the department hold all the information here and engagement with 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 yourselves and and as I, I appreciate one size won't fit all so i think that's that's crucial and that's something that we need to be working on asap so i would would make that a proposal today second issue is just on, on the briefing you had mentioned um that the annual with the annual roadworthiness um the test relaxations so it's just to kind of get to gauge what is the sector's assessment of the mot testing in terms of going forward you know what you know for testing volumes in the future. Obviously, pre-COVID, we were already um, facing issues around the MOT centres, so this is probably doubly compounded. Um, so just in terms of your assessment, how will that impact on the future as we, we try and um, start testing again? 
I, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has, in a sense, um, given them a period of time to sort out their difficulties. Mm -hmm. Because if we wouldn't have had the, the pandemic, there already was an issue in relation to a backlog of tests that then was compounded by the failure of the test equipment. I, I honestly believe in looking at the model in GB, and I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that there needs to be a fundamental review of uh, the DVA testing model. The, the testing model is based on, on vehicles that are now, you know, it's based on a, on a vehicle's condition 20 to 25 years ago. Vehicle um, manufacturing um, standards have now improved considerably. I think we need to review the model to see if it's fit for purpose. I, I would say, Liz, I suppose when, when it comes down to testing, there's this aspect, the grass is always greener. Um, probably about two years ago, I temporarily managed um, the Scottish region for FTA. And I remember chairing some um, meetings with members there, and I outlined to them how vehicle testing was carried out in Northern Ireland. It's done by the department, public sector, and they were extremely envious. Um, they were not happy with the system employed in, in, in GB. And then when you speak to people here, some people obviously think the system elsewhere is fair. So there's this thing that people obviously think. I think the system here, I think it's good that, uh, that it's run by the public sector, that there is oversight over it. Um, I, I just think, yeah, the problem going forward, they're going to need support. They're going to need the funding, the manpower. There's going to be a lot of um, discussions with the unions and staff in this because there will be an incredible amount of work um, when we come out of this. Uh, and there will be a backlog, not just on, on the MOT side of things, but on, on the IVA and the ADR as well. So I think the, the, you know, the facilities will, and the staff will need all the support it can from the department. Okay. I think if, if there was private sector involvement in the test and set up in Northern Ireland, we wouldn't be in the position that we're currently in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I must say, I do find it very disconcerting uh, to hear from Mr. Martin that there's been a lack of engagement from the department, which uh, uh, I, I don't believe to be entirely uh, the case in relation to um, dialogue with the minister. I understand that the minister has responded on a number of occasions directly to Mr. Martin and the association, and I note his very long career within DVA. So I'm quite sure that when uh, some of the officials on the other side of the phone are speaking to somebody who had over 33 years experience and running the department, uh, or running those services, you know, uh, probably are a bit fearful. But could I just um, say, uh, from what I'm hearing, you know, we're, we're actually now getting to the, the, the bit around the commercial decision that the ferry companies have undertaken in relation to uh, not passing on whatever assistance they got from London uh, to the um, fuel uh, to the freight industry. I mean, I, I am aware of the situation because I do have within my own constituency a number of uh, very high-profile uh, companies who have told me and briefed me a long time ago around this. But uh, as I understand it, uh, the help hasn't been forthcoming from London as yet in terms of the evidence base that's being provided. That's that's what we're hearing, uh, and I just wonder if you have any comments around the evidence base that the industry has given uh, to uh, London. I would have to say, uh, Chair, that as I understand from yesterday, uh, the Minister Murphy said in relation to the £59 million pounds that's held for transport at the centre, uh, it can be bid against by other departments, so it is not ring-fenced for transport. I think that is something we all need to be very clear. And it's most regrettable that, that the Department of Infrastructure is the, only is the only department that remains outside of the executive, not having a direct access to its own budget. Uh, so th that is a serious uh, matter of concern f for uh, ourselves. Um, the, the, the issue around um, the furlough, I mean, I think the flexibility is around for, I think that's a very good point and very well made. It's something I would be very keen uh, that we would pick up on whether or not we have the ability internally uh, to, to actually add those flexibilities uh, in relation to the Treasury. Um, in relation to the Across Ireland trade, I mean, that's a critical point because a lot of small one lorry mm -hmm. companies, uh, I think, that need uh, further assistance, uh, particularly in the context of Brexit. And perhaps we can have the industry back again, Chair, in relation to some of the Brexit uh, concerns that need to be um, articulated. Um, but the, the 
The, uh, the question I have then really is, and, and sorry, the proposition, and I, I want to make this clear because some members don't seem to be getting the point. The proposition in terms of help for the industry is a matter for the economy and finance ministers. The transport minister is only responsible for regulations, as I understand it. So uh, in terms of the evidence base being provided by, by the companies or the industry sector to London, uh, where, where is that at in terms of process and what feedback have you had from London in relation to that? Because that's critical uh, in terms of trying to move forward, I think. On, on the evidence, um, the Department for Economy, um, you know, they've been very, well, from the start of this COVID, um, they were very in tune with, the, yeah. right across industries, but with transport, there was a team there, a dedicated team set up to take account of the financial pressures. Um, I know I submitted, I had members that give me financial accounts, mm -hmm. confidential, showing their forecast, yeah. their profit and loss. I've shared that with the Department for Economy. It clearly illustrates the pressures and ultimately that was shared then basically the department of economy have used that in their discussions with london but also centrally fta i shared that with our head office who were able to show the pressures and and we highlighted when we put down our ask to government we specifically said the geographic pressure for northern ireland because of that added mm -hmm. journey mm -hmm. with, with the trade imbalance and, and the ship so so the, the evidence is there the department of economy has been shared this i know um on the department for infrastructure also put together um a team working on this and i shared some information with them and they were very helpful and, and, I, and I know experiences differ um but uh, during this period of time it's been a very difficult time for everyone over the last eight to ten weeks yeah. um i know from top to bottom um, with my dealings with the Department for Infrastructure, um, they have engaged um, under incredible pressures. Uh, uh, and I know in um, not just in individual circumstances where I've intervened on members' requests where there has been assistance given and, and, and solutions uh, found, um, but it has been helpful, but I understand you know, we're looking at things maybe slightly diff different maybe to, to um, the RHA and the FTA. And our, our, we, have, we share a lot of the same members, but also we represent a lot of different sectors as well. But I know for us, um, the support has been there and it, it's been uh, really appreciated. Sorry, Chair, can I just pick up? So you've provided all this evidence, including personal, you know, commercial sense of information, and yet, you know, we haven't seen any shift. Uh, so what have they said in response and what time frame have they given you? Well, because the, 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 the emphasis of this was on um, discussions with Treasury and the economy, and I know the economy minister has also been very helpful on yeah, this. Yeah. Um, she, she's certainly fought the corner for the industry on this, mm -hmm. but it, it hit a brick wall basically in London on this for the time being. Likewise, RHA have um, been engaging with members, and like the FTA, we've got company accounts and company profiles and financial projections, and that has been shared with DFI and DFA. Uh, it also has been shared with uh, the Department of Transport and Treasury and GB. Uh, the issue is, I think the case has been made both in Northern Ireland and with DFT. The difficulty seems to be with Treasury, uh, and, and they're not prepared yeah. to release the funds or to accept or whatever. But th that's the feedback that I'm getting. We had a conference call with our chief executive no later than Tuesday, yesterday, and, and he is still hopeful that something will come through. He is still hopeful that something will come through because there's a very, very strong case has been made and they're starting to realise that without an efficient effect of transport sector, the whole economy Absolutely. will suffer. Yeah. And particularly with Northern Ireland because we depend so much on it. Uh, uh, so we do. So it's, it's late in the day, but we're still hopeful Albeit, um, I say, it seems to be the Treasury that the, the, where the problem sits. Chair, can I ask just around the cost? I mean, you've, got, you've obviously done very detailed work on it. So have you any idea of what a cost would be in terms of financial support to alleviate pressures in uh, in immediate term? I, I think, Member, you know, there's, there's no, and that's what I've said, any aid package can't be like, you know, what we've seen in other sectors for hospitality, like a blanket um, scheme. That's not applicable for our industry because not every operator is in the yeah. same boat as such. So it's very hard to give a definitive figure, but I know some companies, you know, um, I, I've seen one company where they give the forecast, um, this is with the end of March, and if things continued as they did until the end of May, um, for the, and this was a large business, but they were going to see a deficit probably of about £700,000 uh, in the reserves. 
if things continue. So, but that was a, that was a, a worst case scenario for a large operator. Uh, but it would differentiate, and that's what I've said. Any package for the industry would need to be uh, means tested and looked at on an individual basis to make it fair. Very bespoke yeah. solution. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, and uh, thank you both for your presentations. Um, and I know that some members express disappointment of the lack of consultation. I have to say, I find that the department has form in this in this way, and I'm not surprised, uh, John, that you have expressed uh, your frustration in the manner that you, that you have. I think if I were the minister, I would be ensuring the senior officials were engaging with you regularly because you have expertise in a field that they need to fail of. Um, we all know that, that transport is a transferred matter. It resides in the Department of Infrastructure, and it has full responsibility uh, for that. Um, I know that you both have said that you share the five points, uh, difference of emphasis here and there, but given that those points have been shared, with uh, both the Minister, the Economy Minister and the Infrastructure Minister, I would hope that this committee would, uh, would lend support because therein lies the basis for the proposals, a proposal that needs to be uh, forthcoming. I noted in the, I read the material that you sent, very interesting, and I know the, the uh, cash flow crisis that the industry is facing, but I would like to, in the, just because we're up against the clock, I would like to deal with two matters. One uh, hasn't been touched on yet, but I just want to satisfy myself uh, around drivers' conditions of work, particularly uh, what had been complained at the beginning of this process, concerns that had been brought to our table around a lack of PPE. Some of the drivers had talked about they hadn't received the kind of PPE that was needed and there was a lack of washing facilities at operational sites. So I just want to know if that has been addressed. <coughs> and secondly, uh, you won't be surprised uh, maybe to hear me ask a question around Brexit. Um, given that 80% of our SMEs, it's been referred to earlier here, operate on an all-Ireland basis, trade across the island, they don't actually operate across uh, the sea, but they do use the industry. For, for the trade across, across the island. I'm conscious that the Institute for Government and others have said that it's unlikely by uh, January 1st that the hardening of the border in the sea uh, will have been put in place. And therefore, whether it's new infrastructure or hardening of the existing infrastructure, I just want to know if you have declared a position, have you arrived at a position given that the clock is ticking and we're only seven months away, uh, and the implications for your industry if it is a crash out Brexit, if it can be afforded by an extension uh, to the period that this transitional period at this moment in time, have you declared a position on the need for an extension so that we don't arrive on the 1st of January to a crash out Brexit and all the damage that it will do to your industry and others? On the first point in relation to drivers' welfare, there was a, a number of issues uh, both within the island of Ireland and in the, the mainland. However, most of those have or appeared to have been addressed. We made representations to a, a number of regional distribution centres, both within the island of Ireland and uh, in mainland GB, and largely it seems to have uh, addressed its, itself now. In relation to Brexit, the RHA position is that we have requested an extension. We feel that the industry would have been under pressure to have prepared for it anyway. without COVID-19. Now, with COVID-19, I don't think the industry will be in a position to cope with whatever is coming down the tracks, and we still don't really no, know what's coming down the tracks. So, yes, we, we have requested an extension, because we will not be in a position to deal with whatever uh, issues are coming down the tracks. It's on PPE. Um, it's a bit critical for us to know after frontline healthcare workers, mm -hmm. and we've obviously requested as essential workers. Um, I know there, there was great, you know, um, in, in the early days of the crisis, we had one large member who were making deliveries to shops and uh, to food processing plants, and they were told outright, your drivers won't be allowed in to make deliveries without face masks, and they could not get face masks anywhere. But 
Thankfully, um, I knew a key member of staff in O'Neill Sportswear, and they actually not just produce face masks for this operator, but gave them free of charge so this company could continue doing their business. So there was great cooperation with some local businesses here mm -hmm. um, on that, but it is something going forward. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down to government guidance about what our drivers are going to require in, in, in the workplace. On Brexit, um, we did in the early stages um, of this year, we did formally request an extension. Um, we were told that that would not be forthcoming, any extension. Um, so our stance now is to prepare for leaving um, the end of the transition period at the end of the year. Um, we've seen probably in the last three weeks uh, a serious increase in the workload. We've seen people in government who were um, put into COVID-related work streams now returning to Brexit um, work. And, um, you know, the way we're preparing our members, like the way we did for a no deal, is aim for this date because, um, you know, prepare to, to fail and, you know, you, fail to prepare, it's, it, you're, you're going to fail on this issue. So it's, it's aiming for the 1st of January, unfortunately. Even if that's a crash out Brexit, you're trying to prepare the industry for a crash out and all the damage that it would we, we, unfor yeah, there, Without an extension, it yeah. looks like the government will be going ahead with, with exit at the end. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And really just to conclude, obviously thank you both very much for, um, for your presentations and taking questions today and a number of issues that the committee will follow up on and, and obviously there's a, a lot of support in this room um, for um, concerns that you have raised. Um, just as a final point from, from each of you, um, sort of to leave us with sort of the priorities moving forward for, for yourselves and that we can really assist you with very briefly. I think the, the key thing for us going forward is some form of package and some form of package where whatever department's responsible for taking it forward uh, engages with the sector to ensure that it meets the needs because it's one size will not fit all. There's so many unique aspects to it. It would have to be discussed in detail with the sector to ensure it addressed uh, the issues and concerns. And, yeah. I think, Madam Chairman, uh, I think what we've seen this period, um, we've seen our, our industry classified as essential. Um, so we need to make sure when we come out of this that the industry and those who work in it are still considered as essential. Um, it's a how we come out of this with the financial aspect is, is key in the months ahead. Like I've said before, people have asked me why have we not seen casualties in this in the industry. It's because it's, it's in the pipeline. Um, the department can certainly help um, going forward. Infrastructure is key for us. Uh, it, it was good to see that there will be an emphasis on continuing roads projects. Um, we support the A5, the A6, York Street interchange. I think to, for government to spend money like that helps our industry. And also, um, the other area you can help with is um, on the relocation, uh, re uh, I suppose, the reallocating of road space. So we're seeing this right across, not just the UK, but right across Europe at the moment, um, cities um, transferring basically the, the city, city streetscape. Uh, we can't fall into the same problems maybe they're encountering in London at the moment where decisions have been made without um, consulting um, businesses on those streets and also the logistics sector. Because what we've got to do, um, we support sustainable transport. We want, as an industry, we want more people to cycle to work, to use public transport, because if you can get people out of cars, it creates extra road space for essential road users like goods vehicles and buses. So, but it's just bear in mind, please, is that the department must consult with the industry about we ensure we still have curbside access, we can still deliver to those shops, bars and restaurants when they reopen. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. No doubt we'll see you in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, members, we've slightly gone over our time, but if we can... Thank you. Thank you. I suppose really just, just to follow up on that, there are a number of issues which have come out of that, with, particularly in relation to the package and, and also with regards to furlough, um, which may be something that um, um, the executive perhaps could add some, some weight to. We need some clarification in relation to 
responsibility with regards to that and whether there is any flexibility for us here or whether um, that request then has to go through to um, Treasury at um, HMG. Um, so members content that we maybe make yeah, I think that's important because uh, certainly I know at home, even for tax returns, some companies have to take staff off furlough to get their tax dockets in in yeah, time. You know. Right. Um, so if Judge, I want to make a couple of suggestions. Um, because clearly, people here, obviously, and the law obviously defend their own ministers. Entitled to do that. There's, uh, well, there's, a, number, there's, are there's, there's, a, there's a number. Tactic. Well, there's, we've asked a number of Britney, questions recently. Called. We've asked a number of questions recently of a number of ministers about responsibility for a number of industry sectors. So what I suggest is this, because you heard today, does information come from the whole sector? Does information that lies within economy? Does information that lies within infrastructure? So does inf information lies within the executive that needs to be all put together to make a proper proposal to support this industry? That's the point we're making. There's also information to support a cohort of taxi the taxi industry, which is not getting support, and also community transport at this moment in time, which we have responsibility for, and unfortunately we hadn't had a meeting. So what I would like to suggest is that a proposal put forward, a question to both ministers, to see whether they work together to bring proposals forward to support those industries. And I also would like uh, departmental officials up here from the DFA to discuss what their proposal, what they brought forward in terms of the following of the department as well, and I'd like support for the, from the committee for that as well. Yeah, I think probably just if we if we think about well, of the discussions that we've just had and deal with that, and then sort of move on to the next point, if that's okay. So just with specifically in relation to, to the haulage industry, if we we write if you want to write then to um, infrastructure minister to um, through to economy and also to, to finance just in relation to um, assistance which is required for, for hauliers um, and uh, I suppose it really would like to have an update then as to where the, I suppose what the feelings were with regards to the evidence and what additional evidence was required in, in order to, um, to meet the threshold for, for Treasury. And the communication. Um, but, Chair, I have to say, I find it very strange that a person who worked in the department for 33 years led, that, led the units you know, um, is fighting communication problems. Okay, so There's no communication. We find out. Right. Okay, we're, we're starting to muddy things up yeah. a little bit. So, but just in relation to where we are with regards to the package, um, if we were going to write to um, infrastructure minister mm -hmm. and to economy mm -hmm. and also to finance, mm -hmm. because there yeah. seems to be some sort of confusion but. in relation. In, in relation to who has responsibility for what and what information that they have and what information then has come back from, from Treasury. And so we need to see mm. where the where Adam they Jerry. didn't meet where they didn't meet the threshold of evidence. From uh, listening to the finance minister, it's clear that his role is to assess bids that are made by other departments. So uh, he he becomes engaged at that point. That's in relation to, to the furlough as well, I think, that they then well, for, provide to for him. Furlough, furlough was largely uh, HMRC, it's, it's yeah. operated from, from England, I but understand. Where we are, but where we are just so in relation my, to... My, my, my point is I think it's largely lying with infrastructure and yeah, the economy between them, so I, I agree with yeah, that and point. Well, and the then they put the bid... Well, let's, well, let's well, finish well, off well, today. And, and, I and I appreciate that, but still, there still needs to be a discussion, I think, with, with finance around this, finance as, as well as, a, as a co a coordinating all of this oh. too. Yeah, so and so finance is in connector with HMT. Sorry, could could say that we've heard... Uh, repeatedly, that there's 59 million for transport. Is that ring fenced? But he said it was. Well, uh, we've been told it's not. We've been told it's not. No, no, no it's not been ring fenced, so but that's been dropped today. Yeah, but we had said that it had been said that this had been set aside for yes. for transport. But again, we haven't had clarification in relation to whether or not it's been ring fenced, which of course was the critical issue in regard yeah. to that. Chair, sure, there's one issue. The issue from the haulage industry. They're asking about the communication issue. So. That question has to be asked directly. Well, the communication is a separate issue then to, yeah. to, to your department uh, to um, infrastructure. Um, so I need to know what I'm doing. So I'm writing to the Minister for Finance, Minister for Infrastructure, Minister for Economy about the assistance to hauliers. Yes, yeah, the yeah, evidence that's fair. And lack of evidence. Yeah, because what, um, we need, what we need is an, exec an executive yeah. approach in yeah. relation to, yeah. um, to that. And again, I suppose a similar letter in relation to taxi industry. We, again, we need an executive yeah. approach to Community that. Transport, yeah. Yeah. And but, but, Chair, the point I'm making. And Ray Beggs has mentioned it. Until there's a proposal brought to the floor, 
All I'm saying, all that information and data lies within. That's why I ask clarification. Who has all the data? Because DFA have all the information on taxis, information, PSVs, licensing. That's where you get the information. And until you know all that, you will not be able to put forward a proper proposal. That's the question I'm asking. Which, of course, yeah, which, which, which is really part of the actual proposal to the Minister to facilitate. Yes, but what, what we have established in all of this is that nobody works in isolation. Um, so you know, there's, there has to be sort of a, a coordination between departments in yes, order absolutely. for it to be able to... And, and we all know that the ferries... There's no point in, in all of us falling out and playing party politics but, around and that's the point, sure. whenever, at the uh, end yeah. of the day, there are people out there who have major issues, financial issues, mortgages to pay and families to, to feed, and you know, we can't really start, start to fall apart with regards to that, we need to get to the bottom of this and try to get them the support that they need. That's what we're trying to find out. But Chair, can I say, I'm trying to draw attention here, I'm over in the corner, um, you know, if we're not playing party politics with this, then get the two ministers that can actually put a proposal together and bring it to the finance minister so that we can move this forward, rather than you know this thing, oh, we need, to, we need to contact all ministers. The finance minister needs a proposal. Everyone around this table will support those proposals if those two ministers can work together and bring the proposal to the finance minister. So if we're going to write, we need to at least be very clear in the process and what we're actually saying, well, as opposed to a letter to all three, and will somebody somewhere do something about this and nobody take responsibility for it? Okay, well, we can, we can make that, that reasonably clear, I think. Okay, I think it's just too. important in that correspondence, the timeliness of the response is really important because from speaking to people, you know, time's of the essence here. You mm -hmm. know, they've built businesses up over years and they're now looking at losing them, and it's really important that particularly the economy and the infrastructure ministers come together with the support from the finance minister to deliver a package of support because to see these businesses fall would be. Okay. And then the other issue then is in relation to the flexibility around furlough. And again, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's that we, a critical that's issue. That's something yeah. that we maybe need to discuss directly with the, the finance minister because just to see whether there are any flexibilities in relation to furlough. Sure, I, I would like to ask the officials of the DFA up to see exactly, because this is part of the whole COVID process, and ask them what, what discussions they have had within their own department. Yeah, well, so that, that's a separate issue. Okay. A separate issue. The, the, the weekly furlough issue is specific to the oh, whole layers, which is being raised today, which is what okay. we want to talk about now. That, that is another mm -hmm. issue. But with regards to it's about flexibilities, week, it's flexibilities, flexibilities and flexibilities. I think that the information with yeah. around that specific issue will lie with the, the finance, finance. Um, because obviously direction will be coming through from Treasury. Mm, HMT. It's a Treasury issue. Okay. okay. So. Uh, so can I just recap? We're writing to both, or to the DFI, DFE and the Department of Finance Minister on the Assistant Royal Years, and we'll put in that it should be a package between the Infrastructure Committee and the or Minister and the Economy Minister yes, the that the that. Finance well, Minister we're, we're should look at. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're, we're looking for a solution. A solution. We really want them yeah. to be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we're doing the same for time. Both departments are involved because this is the service industry. Yeah. And if the service is not there, the economy will suffer. Yeah. Uh, and the detailed information is with infrastructure. Uh, uh, so, so I think they both need to be aware. One's case on their own will probably not fly. So, both need to be involved in a solution. Yeah. But the issue in relation to taxi, it needs to be a separate letter. That's yes, correct. Because doing the issues letter. are very, very different. Yes, because very there's different. obviously been yep. um, extensive conversations in mm -hmm. relation to the haulage industry and what's required. So, it needs that's to be separate. That's the three ministers as well. Yeah, but it, yeah. Yeah, it strikes yeah. me, chair, that the the haulage one is one that's. You know the, these islands wide in terms of solution. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know because Whereas the, the tax and it's very much a bespoke local. because some hauliers are making a load of money because oh, yeah. of the increased supermarket take up and others are left sitting parked up. But DFT and Treasury are not going to move forward for something. We need to move forward for something here in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Some of these businesses the, will be gone. Yeah. But at the same time, we still need to be very mindful of the comments that John made in that there may be something coming down the line. Yeah. That we then don't. Jump Jeopardize. And then we end up then having to fund something. But at the same time, we still need to raise it because I'm Absolutely. guessing that whether our response won't be that timely. And <laughs> Chair, I, th I think we need to make the point that any financial support needs to be targeted at yeah. those who mm -hmm. need it, as yeah, opposed yeah. to a blanket. Similar to the rates. Madam Chair, I, I disagree. I disagree. I don't think we have the funds 
to save every every job, every business here. That's just the reality. And if we are, we are, I think you're kidding yourself. What we need to be focused on is enabling the economy to move forward and allowing those those guys that are all on furlough, allow them to start and bring them back, perhaps a, a few days a week, or allow them to get a back load still still to export our goods and then perhaps encourage them to keep trading, because this moment in time they're trading at a loss. So at some point we will not be able to export our ag agricultural products or other manufactured products if we don't have a backload coming in. So it needs to be focused on the economy going forward. Uh, well, and, that's that's, and that's where the flexibility around the furlough then oh, is critical too, for them to be able to have the workforce in place and able to respond to... But if you think just give it to those in most need, that, that will not work. You'll just pour money. Well, it was, it was, I suppose it was clear really from the industry too that there needs to, it, it's not a one size fits yeah. fits all, and it's about looking at it. And it's it. the industry most in need that we're talking about here, as opposed okay, to, so I, know, I know objective need is not something that you embrace too often. Each other, so just be clear where we are. Can I just exactly. confirm then? Right, we're doing the letter on the whole, whole, whole air support package. We're doing, are we doing a letter on the 59 million set aside for transport to query yes, if it is a ring fence? Do so we want clarity on that? Okay. And then we're doing a letter to the three ministers on taxis and a support package for them. No, it's not the three ministers on taxis then. We need, well, I suppose... It's and the community I transport suppose, issues now. Well, 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 yeah. I suppose whenever we're, that, yeah. when, if we're writing to the finance minister, it's about lending our support to the, to the taxi industry. So if he does receive a package, then obviously that... But, um, but I suppose we really need them, to all, need them all to be working together. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's no, I understand that, Chair, and I really appreciate it. I'm just going back to what Mr. Begg said. If there's a proposal that goes on the table, we have no problem supporting it. All I'm saying to you, for a proposal to go on the table, there will need pro it need properly costed, and that information lies within those two departments. It doesn't lie within any other department. Community transport is the same. The, the, the costings and the information lies within the economy and DFA. And if there, if there's a cost or proposal brought forward, we'll certainly support it, not a bother. Well, community transport's within DFI. Yes, exactly. But it's supposed to be the payments out and any of this COVID mostly lies within the economy. That's all I'm saying. If it goes a proposal, that's all. so that's all I'm saying. So we would like. All I'm doing is, is asking for support for all these. Here. Okay. So the money going. So the money taxi going. letter. Can I just at one point to clarify: Is community transport a charity? Well, community transport, 70, around 70% mm -hmm. of their funding comes directly from the department. Yeah, the, remainder, the, remainder, wonder, you know. the remainder of their funds then come from um, self-financing. Yes. So that's yeah. where they pick up the just one group. groups or whatever else. Yeah. Probably involves so, the community um, minister as well. And so just was, but, but, yeah. the, but the funding is primarily comes from DFI, yeah. and there's yes. assistance has come yeah, from DERA. In the past, the committee, committee has made representation in relation to support from that other departments who benefit health and communities yeah. also benefit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they should be that's, involved. That's in that. And again, I raised that yesterday with the with the finance yeah. minister. Um, Could I ask a question, Chair? Certainly. With regards to the 59 million, I'm just unsure what letter you're going. What clarity are you asking? Are you going to ask? Has the fine? Has the infrastructure minister put in bids to proposals to spend that? We know it's sitting there at the centre. Uh, so, mm -hmm. do we know? Is this part of her plan? Has she? What? What are you? What are you asking for in terms we, we, of clarity? Just so, because I didn't know what you were saying we, about. We, asking. I think we, we need some clarity in relation to whether this 59. Because I think we we have the understanding that there was 95 million set aside for transport. Yes. Yeah, and and the rest is so, spent. So um, so some of that's been spent. Obviously, 30 million has gone to. To translink some of the translink airports, airports. Some of the airports. Yeah. So it's really the status of that remainder because obviously there's an expectation from various folk within transport that they all have have a potential claim on that. Mm. So it's really about understanding where that money sits and where it can be accessed because we also remember we have a, a correspondence from the chief executive of Translink saying that he's been given a cask iron guarantee that um, the shortfall in his budget is going to be plugged. Now, is that because there was an expectation that that money would do that? So I think we just need some okay. understanding as to where this yeah, 59 million is and how it can be spent and who can who can avail of it. Okay. And if it is ring fenced And whether it's ring fenced or not, all, absolutely. That's right, because again, places. this may yeah. be something. So it's really just about understanding yeah. that okay. amount of money. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Is that clear? So, just to confirm, taxi letter, is that going to the three ministers or just the two? I think this still needs to go three. to three. That's okay. Because, again, yep. I think this needs to be... It does no harm. Should they come back and say it's not relevant? It should really not relevant. It doesn't make any difference to her. Okay. Yeah. Does that include the coach industry as well? Because I think we've all been lobbying the coach, tourist coach. Yeah, listen. <laughs> let's let's, let's, let's yeah. deal with what we have right. because we're, we're, we're very much yeah. over our time, yeah. and I, I just want to right the furlough one still with, and we, and we need to then obviously write then furlough the weekly weekly furlough, weekly furlough. But there's also then an issue to our own minister in relation to to furlough, and we need some clarity as to you know, when she approached TransLink, NI Water, Community Transport, and DVA in relation to um, furloughing okay. staff. Is furlough something that all departments are doing at the minute, is it? Um, yeah, yeah, do, yeah, all of them are. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really about when that approach was made and you know what um, assistance is being given. I, I do know what I've written to her in relation to okay. the community transport one, and I understand there's progress has been made in relation to that. Um, but there seems to have been a reluctance around furlough, but we need again, I think, much clearer, clearer, yeah. clearer uh, yep. information around that. Yep, sure. Okay, is that it sort of tied up? Sure. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for yeah. your patience. I mean, it's been a while. That covers your issue okay. in community transport. Grant. Yes. Yes. Same with community okay. transport. Yeah. Community transport. I, and I've written to her personally. Really yeah. Do you want the separate well. one on and community and transport? Happy to share that. I, we have to do the separate one on community transport as well, do we? Yeah. Well, again, the issue in relation to community transport will be um, around well, community transport, the furlough things, all in there. The issues around their budget. Yes. Yeah. The budget. That's um, it. They've, they've now had letters in relation to the first quarter. But the problem for them moving forward will be that they need an enhancement on, yes. their, um, on, their, on their budget. That's it. Good. Otherwise, they will be this. I think, okay. bit, Chair, the EU is also a big um, problem coming down the yeah, line for them, for too. Yeah. 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 Please don't well, make well, that That's where they get a large well, amount of funding. Please don't <laughs> make it today. And Chair, I okay. appreciate it because we haven't met for a while and we'll get to all okay. these issues yeah. coming up. All right. Okay. Yeah. right. Moving then on to correspondence. Are members content with um, the suggestions? Um, in the table. Read. Yeah, yeah, okay. Read. There was just one thing in relation to um, the Mineral Products Association, and I know we'll all have met Gordon Bass at some stage. Um, uh, sort of as a follow up from, from the meeting with the CBI, he wants to meet with the committee. Um, so we're content that we add that into our formal yes, programme. It might be something yeah. we'll add in um, in the next sort of few weeks. Okay. And looking at the forward work, pro work programme. For next week, we have departmental briefing on the monitoring round, which obviously goes for other budget issues. And then the following week um, is um, TransLink. And really, it was about trying to address the two issues that were outstanding from before we went into lockdown. So that will be covered in those two weeks today, obviously, on the 10th of June. And then it's about populating then moving forward. At this stage, we're still restricted, really, with time. Yep. So it, it's if you're still, it'll still only really probably be one briefing and then our own opportunity to discuss outstanding issues, if you're content. Yeah. Right. So we'll put MPA in the, the 17th of June. OK. So... Chair, I presume we'll get a response back prior to the 10th of June from the TransLink regarding the furlough question. I presume we'll have that. I know it's not directly their position to answer it, but we should have a clarity on that, shouldn't we? Yeah. Before the 10th, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One well, thing in the table papers, we got a reply back from the uh, DALO um, in relation to um, issues on the 29th of April. Mm -hmm. It said this exercise is about the, the monies. This exercise is due to be returned to the Department of Finance on the 29th of May and will identify capital slippage as well as projects and could be taken forward in 2020-21. It would be good to have that for next week as part of the finance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Page on, please. Yeah. 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 Oh, hopefully that will oh, be your heart. Well, you can <laughs> tell me after. It's okay. Mm -hmm. no, hopefully we'll have that information oh, then. Page 20 on the table papers. We'll have that information for the 3rd uh -huh. of June, and obviously then John McGrath and others will be... It's good to have that. Scrutinise that. Okay, members content? Anything further? Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, are you finishing up? Are you doing yeah. AOB? Just f yeah, we'll move on to AOB. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Liz had uh, raised an issue in relation to Nuri around the pedestrianisation. Um, in the chair or, or in the chamber yesterday, and I've been getting um, a lot of um, communication from those around the city centre of Derry who've also been heard the minister make an announcement that the same thing would happen there. They're deeply concerned, and they're saying nothing about us without us. 
don't be talking about pedestrianisation without talking to us, those that are going to be affected, the shops uh, and others, and how they're going to have to operate. So again, they're asking for consultation to take place. Had there been an announcement that a consultation process will take place to see how that this would all unfold, that would have been better. But the way the announcement was, was without consultation, and they are asking that the Minister... So I think I would like the committee to support the need for all of those areas that was mentioned that were going to be pedestrianised, that there would be a consultation takes place um, with particularly all of the shops around those areas that have got very strong views and know what's best uh, for the area and what would work. Okay, well, our members content that, again, we write to the Minister, obviously supporting the, the, what she's, she's, she's proposing to do, but at the same time being very Just mindful of those who are using that. And I think that That's was good. raised by okay. Seamus at the end of his presentation, just in relation to... Um, Access for um, sort of yeah, key traffic yeah. as well so, too. So um, it's a good idea, but if we can, yeah, with those so if we can be um, directly impacted. The usual people. stuff that we're trying to do, uh, greening, you know, environmentally friendly versus the needs of retail. Yeah, to be getting that balance. There right. has to be a balance. Yeah. Okay, so if you're content, then yep. we'll, we'll yep. raise that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just be mindful when, when you're leaving the room, um, obviously, of social distancing, and can you remove all your papers, your, your water bottle, and, and cup, and so on as well, whenever you're, you're going. The date and time of the next meeting will be um, next Wednesday on the 3rd of June at 10 a.m. in this room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.